We're going to give it we're going to give it just a minute or so, just so everyone has an opportunity to come on in and we can uh, begin this session without having to do a lot of repeat work <laughs> um, as everyone is coming in and getting settled. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us on today. Welcome and welcome again. I hope you all are having a great day so far. It is Wednesday, it's hump day, yay. We've at least made it this far into the week. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm gonna um, go ahead and, and start. I wanna make sure that Judy has as much time as she possibly can for today's session. So I wanna go ahead and start our session today. Thank you again for joining us for this uh, Operations Peer Network um, session today on onboarding and retention. My name is Miriam Dix. I am the facilitator for the um, Operations Peer Network for Together SC. And I serve in that role alongside with a leadership team with our peer network, Operations Peer Network. Um, we have Don Dowden, we have um, uh, Andrea Tucker, we have um, Spencer. Now I'm going to start getting in trouble because I'm going to try to remember everybody's name. Uh, <laughs> we have Spencer, um, and I can't think of Spencer's last name now I think about it. Uh, we also have... Um, several other folks that are part of our leadership team that I think they may be joining us today. I see Dawn already out here. Um, Spencer Scott, thank you so much for doing that. Um, and Jeffrey Fleming is a part of our group as well. Um, and we also have our special guest, uh, Ben, with Together SC, who comes and joins us whenever he can. So he may join us today. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Together SC. And uh, he may join us toward the end. So we may have Ben join us. And we come together as a team to develop programming that we think is effective um, and timely for the work that you do as operators within your organizations. And we want to make sure that we continue to do that. So uh, anytime that you have a thought about a different program that you'd like for us to, um, to craft some information around, you're definitely welcome to uh, a quick today put in a chat or you know send some communication to Together SC because we're always looking to make sure that we fulfill the needs that you have as operators. And so today, um, I also want to thank our sponsors. We are sponsored by Marsh McLennan Agency. Um, David Slade uh, sometimes will join us in these sessions. They provide the, um, the insurance plan, the health insurance plan that Together SC has, the association plan. Um, they administer that plan on behalf of Together SC, and they sponsor our Operations Peer Network gatherings. So we want to thank our sponsors today. Now, getting right into it, uh, I would like to introduce to you today Judy Horton. Judy Horton is president of the Horton Consulting Group. Um, I say Horton Consulting. <laughs> I'm not sure the group is on the end. I have 180 Manager Group. Horton Consulting. And uh, she and I have a lot in common in that she's the president and she also has a vice president who is her husband who provides some services in the veteran community. And Judy's focus is on career counseling and career coaching, but also helping with team development in that HR space. I know she serves as a leader in our uh, South Carolina's um, uh, Association for the SHRM. So our SHRM so, was it so Society of Health Resources Professionals. I think that's how it goes. And so she, she serves in a leadership capacity as well with SHRM. Uh, she just has a wealth of experience of 20 plus years of experience working in HR capacity and career coaching and counseling and all those good things. And so Judy, I know I love to call on Judy because she's so knowledgeable. If I have some questions about you know HR and HR consulting, I can always call on Judy to answer some of those. Um, I can always count on Judy to answer some of those questions. And so really looking forward to what she has to share with us today in that space of onboarding and retention. Now, this is a part two. We started recruitment, I think. Uh, that was back in, was it December? Oh, gosh. It was. Oh, my goodness, December. 
I think it was December, we had an in-person session in Columbia and uh, Judy was uh, gracious enough. She's in Spartanburg to come down to Columbia to host or facilitate that session in person on recruitment. We had such a great time. We did not complete, you know, <laughs> completely get through all the things that we wanted to discuss. And so Judy, again, being very gracious, has given us an opportunity to have sort of that second half of the recruitment and retention um, session that we wanted to have. So we're focusing on onboarding <laughs> and retention today. So definitely thank Judy. Thank you, Judy, for um, being with us today. And with that, I'm going to hand over this uh, session to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Miriam. It's it's great to be back with everyone. And um, for those of you who were with us back in the first session back in December on recruiting, um, uh, welcome to this section. Uh, and But for those of you who weren't with us back in December, um, yes, you did miss some stuff, but it, that's okay. Um, because today we're looking just at onboarding, retention, and some best practices. So we're going to talk through all of those things. So if you'll give me just a moment, let me get my screen shared, get us all going here. Make sure I've got chat open so I can see what you have to say. Get the slideshow going. All right, super. All right. So again, just going to talk today about some best practices. Are these the only practices? No. Uh, but what I want to do today is share some things with you. And along the way, feel free to either come off of mute or pop in chat. I've got the chat window open. I do not mind interruptions. I would much rather you stop me while you have the thought on your brain to say, hey, Judy, what about this? So please do that. So as Miriam mentioned, my husband and I are a bit of a duo. Um, quite frankly, he's, he's more retired than working, but he does help me with a lot of work on the veteran side. And I did want to show you my two fur babies on the right there. That's Charlie and Argos. They are in my office with me. On occasion, they like to chime in. So I hope that doesn't startle you. And I certainly hope it doesn't startle me and lose my thought. But I just wanted to give you a heads up. One of the things that I love about the work that I do and talking with groups like yours is that I want to find and help you create that aha moment. You know, that time where we, something kind of pops into our brain, we go, yep, I got it. That makes sense to me. And I like it when we can take those aha moments and transfer it into our lives whether that's work or personal. And of course, today we're gonna to talk you know, about the work side. So as Miriam mentioned, we're gonna talk about onboarding and retention, but specifically, I wanna make sure that you know how important it is and why it's important. And I'm also gonna fold in orientation. And a lot of people think orientation and onboarding are the same thing, but they're a little bit different. So we're going to talk about that. And I want to share best practices and then also go into some retention pieces and parts that you can easily implement into um, your work life. And also, let's talk about and we'll wrap up with career development. How do you take care of your people? Um, I know that many of you do not have large budgets and the stuff that I'm going to talk about to you today does not require large budgets. Um, I think these are things that can transcend any organization. Today's session is indeed approved for one PC, both with SHRM and with HRCI. I know several of you have asked me in the past about having um, my programs pre-approved and today we have them. So I'll share the code at the end of the program today. And then Desmond A is also going to send out this presentation. 
So don't feel like you've got to take copious notes because we're going to make sure this material gets out to you. So I'm just curious, um, would you just pop into chat? What, what made you sign up for today's session? Oh, you're welcome, Amanda, about the SHRM code. You bet. Turnover. Yes, Mary, that's so important. High turnover, new ideas. Sure. What else? Yeah. You know, Cheryl, I think it's great that we all get a good gut check. What are, are we doing everything we can do? What are other people doing out there? Um, you know, we don't want to lose our people. Yeah, these are all great things. Thank you so much for sharing in chat. Um, I'm going to give an opportunity, provided we have time, um, to just share some things. So if I, um, you know, I'm going to be sharing lots of things today, but if if you're doing something that you think would help the group, then I want to give you an opportunity to share that because that's what this is about, is to be able to share. And so let's, let's get into this. A lot of the resources I'm sharing with you today are from SHRM. For those of you who are not familiar with SHRM, it's the Society for Human Resource Management. A lot of their materials are free. You don't even have to be a member of SHRM. But if you have any type of HR responsibility, I would certainly encourage you to join SHRM because you get a whole lot of other uh, materials. But I'm not going to regurgitate everything from SHRM today, but I just wanted to make sure that you had that as a resource. So with onboarding, and this is an interesting statistic, and it's from SHRM. They did a recent study that only 12% of the people that were onboarded in a 12-month period, only 12% thought that their employer had a good onboarding program. Only 12%. That's pretty sad. And, and I think about the companies that I've worked for and the amount of effort, and I'm sure the amount of effort that you're putting into you know, creating an onboarding program and only 12% are getting something good out of it, well, that's not so great, is it? And furthermore, you know, if, if only 12% are getting impacted and think it's a good thing, then obviously our processes are flawed. They're, they're not perfect. And I don't think that they have to be perfect, but they need to be better. And that's why we're talking today. We need to really put focus towards our program. So I'm so glad that all of you are here today. When we have a good, doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be outstanding, but when we have a solid onboarding process, studies show that we are going to retain 91% of our first year employees. And then, of course, the percentages go up. If we can keep them for a year, then odds are we're going to keep them for another year. So onboarding is really critical to reduce that turnover. And let's have that 91% retention. <laughs> I giggle at this. I know how excited I have been on my first day. Do you all remember that? whether it's the job that you have today or your last job, but, but people are like little kids. They get excited. They want to come to work. They, they feel a little bit like superheroes, right? And we need as organizations to capitalize on that feeling, on that emotion. And remember that, you know what, we're all still a little bit kid-like and that we want to feel welcomed we want to feel included and we want to feel special. And so let's capitalize on the, those little kids, superhuman or superhero feelings. So onboarding is a complete process. Mm -hmm. And 
it goes from the very first encounter that an employee has with your organization. I'm straight to breathe. Thank you. I think we had someone come off mute. Um, was there a question there? Okay. Um, but it's a complete process. And when you think about the very first interaction that uh, a candidate has, so even before we've hired them, so how do we treat and how do we engage with that person from the time that they apply all the way up to the early months of them working for our organization, that's onboarding. All those touch points that we have with that person is onboarding. And so that's why I say it can last up to 12 months. Now, I know all of us are not doing onboarding programs for 12 months, but that's really kind of the point from the very first um, engagement that we have with that person, the onboarding begins. And so we want to have the right talent and get them onboarded appropriately. So there's three kind of basic goals, if you will, of onboarding. So the first thing is we want them to acclimate. We want them to get used to us and us to them. And this is a great way to start the conversation about what we as a company, we as an organization expect of them. Now, some of that might've happened during the interview process, but now it's, it's the real deal. And how does their role play in the overall organization? And, and this is especially important for smaller organizations that someone understands all that is on them for their role, their responsibilities, their expectations. And we need to manage that along the way. We need to engage with them. And it's an active thing. It's not a sit back in my office and, you know, how, how is Miriam doing or how's Desmond A doing? I need to go out and reach out to these people. Um, build those relationships early and continuing to and continue to grow those. And we want to talk about how we are committed to their growth and whatever that looks like for that individual. And then, of course, we want to retain them. And onboarding is where that begins, that retention. And having that ongoing engagement is so critical. And by focusing and being purposeful in our actions towards engagement, retention naturally goes up. There are studies that show this. And quite frankly, it's going to decrease your costs. If we can focus on the 91%, right? 91% retention in the first year. But if we don't, and if we lose someone within that first year, it's going to take us nine months in money, if you will, to replace them. So let's say I've been hired on, I, I made it to my 10th month or 11th month, and then I quit for whatever reason. So now, of course, as you all know, you've already you know, dealt with this pain, I'm sure. Now you have to go through the whole process of dusting off my job description, getting it posted, reviewing resumes, all, that whole bit of recruiting. But then to get someone up to speed takes a while. So all while that's happening, our organization is losing productivity and losing that means losing money. So let's talk about the difference between orientation and onboarding. Now, orientation is a part of onboarding, but a lot of people use these words interchangeably. And I think, you know, if, if you get the wording wrong, that's okay. But if you get the actions right during this process, that's really what's important. Orientation is the, the basic stuff. It's the new hire, you know, your paperwork, your, you know, how do I get paid? What's my direct deposit? How often do I get paid? 
you know, kind of the core, let me just get you signed on to the company, if you will. And it's really just getting them familiar with the organization. Different organizations require different levels of orientation. I have some clients that they are able to do it in a day and it's fine. And then onboarding continues from that. Others with orientation, they have it last for two or three days because they do, you know, things like facility tours and introductions across the organization. And that might be multiple sites, whatever the case may be, as long as it's tailored to your organization and that you're able to repeat it in an easy way and you're getting the information that you need across. Onboarding, you start talking about the goals and responsibilities for that person. And how do those goals and responsibilities play into the team that they're on and the larger organization? People, especially now, um, post-pandemic, I've heard this quite a bit, people are clamoring to know their why, that they want to understand where what they're doing plays a part in the, in the larger organization. And now these things may be formal or informal, but as long as you have some structure to it and it's repeatable, that's one of the key things to look at. In orientation, it's tailored to your organization. It could be one day, two days, maybe three. But onboarding is going to be a continuous engaging activity, at least for the first three or four months. Now, I've seen some organizations say, well, you know what? I treat the whole first year as onboarding because I'm making some more concerted efforts. Again, whatever is the right thing for your organization, large or small, but that you're making that engagement a focus. So here are just some, some simple best practices. And, and, and I call this pre-onboarding. There's lots of activities that need to take place before the new hire's first day. You know, it might be you get them a computer, maybe you have to give them a cell phone or a phone extension, you know, whatever those, those basic things. If you're working in an office, I mean, they need a desk, right? These all sound like really simple things, but I tell you that we have organizations today that are doing a terrible job of the pre-work. And so what happens is we have employees showing up on day one, their email's not working, they don't have a phone extension, their desk is dirty, whatever the case may be. And so it's really important to do that pre-work so day one, they can start hitting the ground running, truly. And part of that preparedness makes them feel welcomed, makes them feel special. And those are really keys to tune in and tune into on their first day. Something else you might want to do is send an email out to not only the new hire, but also to the team that they'll be working with. So everybody is informed. Um, the new hire email might look like, you know, this is where you park. This is our dress code. Um, we're casual here on Fridays, so we wear jeans. Whatever those things are that you want to help them be prepared. And I'll give you an example. A company that I was working with um, hired a veteran. And Miriam mentioned that I do work with veterans. And as you can imagine, veterans are very used to a uniform. And during the interview process, this person was in a suit and tie. This was a man. And the people that he interviewed with were all in, you know, nice outfits, dresses, suits, whatever the case may be. So he assumed that that was the attire of the workplace. 
So when he showed up on day one in his suit and tie, he was completely out of place because the environment was business casual. The guys were in khakis and golf shirts or button downs with no tie. So he felt immediately out of place. Now that might sound like a really, ah, well, that's not a big deal, but that day one feeling can quickly be eroded when they feel out of place. So any type of prep work that you can help communicate, whatever your culture is, whatever your environment is to help them feel more at ease is so important. And I would also ask that the hiring manager do a reach out. It might just be a simple email, maybe it's a phone call, or whoever their direct manager is going to be. Those little extra um, touch points make a difference on that first day. So with orientation, I mean, obviously you want to have the standard paperwork, the I-9, the, the benefits, whatever your payroll is, of course, those things. What is the specific timekeeping practices for your organization? Is it a time card? Is it maybe everyone's on salary and you don't need a time card? How do you handle PTO and vacation? Um, if they need to take a sick day, what are those processes that everybody is understanding what they are up front? And certainly during orientation, you want to make sure that they get a copy or have access to a handbook. Um, I'll, I'll step on my soapbox with, um, with my HR hat. Please make sure that they sign the handbook, that they acknowledge it. And if you have separate policies around harassment, non-harassment, discrimination, et cetera, make sure they sign all of that on day one to just make sure you have it in your employee record. It's also good to, well, you know, talk about your organization's history. What makes your company special? Now, you might have done some of that during the interview process, but now that they're employee, maybe you can tell more, maybe more of the proprietary information. And certainly give them a tour. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people on day one don't know where the bathroom is or don't know if you are lucky enough to have a cafeteria or a nice break room, whatever the case may be, they don't know where those things are on day one and they're hunting for it and we don't want that. And, and what are your safety practices for your location? Making sure that they're aware of, you know, fire drills, tornado drills, whatever the case may be. And sure, employees love swag, but you don't have to buy swag. It could be, you know, a coaster or even a pen with your logo on it. It doesn't have to be really expensive stuff, but something that says, hey, we you're now part of the team. In this last bullet, it, you, this is another one you might giggle at, but what's your trash process? And, and I'll tell you a little story. I, I went to work for a company, huge company, and after like day three or four, my trash can was full. And one of my kind of cube mates started making fun of me. And I was like, well, doesn't cleaning come every night and empty trash? Because my old company did that. Every night cleaning crew would come in and empty our trash, which was a nice thing. But at this new company, they didn't do that. It was on every single employee to empty their own trash and recycle bins. So I, I felt really out of place. So it's just another small thing. So think about what is unique to your office, to your location that you can help them understand on day one. And that will be part of your orientation. So I've talked about first impressions, talked about making sure um, uh, that first day counts. And let's see, Grace, I see you have a question. Any suggestions for setting and managing expectations for younger seasonal employees like interns? Absolutely. Grace, this is a super question. So I think 
with every single person that comes in your door, every single person that is going to work for your organization in whatever capacity that you're making them feel welcome and that you are setting very clear expectations about what is their job and what is not their job. Um, and especially with interns, um, people who haven't been in the workforce much, I think where you can take that extra step in um, the level of detail you give them about what they should be doing. Uh, an example is um, not looking at your cell phone during work hours if you're in a customer facing environment. Now, most of us know that we've been in the workforce for a while, but the younger generation may not really think about that. So again, for your, for your location, for your organization, going that extra distance in the level of detail you provide for interns, I think is the right, the right thing. Good question, Grace. So let's talk about onboarding. One thing that I think is just a wonderful um, thing to do is to assign a buddy. And this buddy um, ideally could be someone that's directly on their team, but I know many of you work in small offices. It, it's really not so important as who the person is, but that that person is available. And this is a person that they can ask anything about. <laughs> where do I take my recycle? Where's the closest restroom from where we are? Or where's a great place to eat lunch at? Maybe they're new to this part of town or new to the city. But someone that they can talk to that's separate from their direct manager. And if, again, you're in a small company or an organization, you can, if it's just a team of two, then you can be that peer buddy. But I think if you give that person permission to say, hey, ask me anything, anything at all, I'll be glad to tell you the greatest pizza, pizza joint here in town, Wh whatever it is. But having someone that they can talk to is really important. Another thing to do is create a 90 day goal plan and set of expectations for that new hire. I would not do it longer than 90 days, although at 90 days you may reset those goals, which I would encourage you to do. But for this orientation and onboarding piece, focus on the first 90 days. What do they need to be doing in the first 90 days to be successful? Now, I've had employees that, you know, they're chomping at the bit, they're excited, they want to do anything and everything, but you as their leader needs to kind of um, coach and guide them on what is the focus for those first 90 days so they don't go meandering into doing things that, you know, are really for later or in the future. You want to help build a solid foundation of their work. And I would encourage you to do periodic check-ins. It, it might be once a week in the first month. And then as they go on beyond that, maybe it's a once a month. But what, and, and it also might be just checking in quickly after you've gotten your morning coffee and saying, hey, how are things going? And that helps establish this kind of open conversation, open door interaction for them to have with you. And you also want to help them build their network within your organization. And, and this might be those that are actually employed by your same organization. Who are the people that they interact most with? So you want to do those introductions. But it also might be who are the people they interact with outside of your organization? And I know a lot of you have that situation. So helping them establish those early on is so important. I mentioned earlier about an introduction um, or an email from the manager. 
I think it's also important that you're sending out an introduction to the team, that you're announcing this new hire. What are their responsibilities? Now, I could talk about change management a whole bunch. That's a whole nother, <laughs> another um, call. But the importance of understanding how change and a new hire is a change, how change impacts your organization is really important. And having one new tire, new hire can create ripple effects. And so by early on, having that introduction helps you reduce those ripples within the organization. And making sure that they understand who are all the different teams, where do they sit? Um, who, who do I talk to most? Where do I get information from? And absolutely on their first day, take them out to lunch. Or, you know, if, if dinner's more appropriate because of the schedule, whatever it may be, but they feel completely welcomed on their first day. I mean, I've, I've seen several employees literally just sitting at their desk come lunchtime, and you can tell that they feel alone. And we don't want them to feel that. Now, if you have people that are remote employees, I mean, that's pretty popular these days, right? You know, maybe it's that you send them a gift card to a local lunch place. And or if you have um, uh, two employees in the same city, then maybe you could have them get together if you're not able to do it. But in some way, make that effort for that first day. I would also, as part of onboarding, you know, where do you keep stuff? Is it paper files? Okay, where are the file cabinets? If it's a shared drive on Google or SharePoint, how do they access it? Where is it? Where should they store their team's information? And if you are large enough to have employee resource groups, tell them about it. If you allow um, membership and professional organizations that support you, tell them about it. Let them know what kind of options they have. And then also talk about opportunities for uh, learning, development. Now, this might be something that's not done maybe in that first day or first week, but maybe a, late, a little bit later conversation, um, but certainly do that. And it's so important that they understand your mission. Now, hopefully you talked about it back during the recruiting process, but this is your opportunity to really get into the, the under the covers importance of the mission and values of your organization. And of course, you're in nonprofits. You all have important missions and they want to be a part of that. And as I mentioned before, but it bears repeating, repeating, please check in with them. How are they doing? That first month, have a one on one with them every week, making sure that they're getting what they need, answering any questions that they have. Do periodic daily check ins. Um, bring them a cup of coffee or hot tea or whatever. Um, these are so important. Thanks, Cheryl. I think the buddy idea um, is, is a good one. I've seen it work really well. Thanks for that comment. So these are things about onboarding. I'm just curious, could, is there anything that your organization is doing from an onboarding and orientation standpoint that I didn't mention that you think the group would like to share? Cause I'm, you know, I don't uh, think I'm the all knowing. So let's see, we've got um, one comment. We have our new employees schedule one-on-one -on -one -on -one meetings for an hour to meet with all team members. Oh, this comes from Sylvia. Sylvia, this is a fabulous idea and I could kick myself for not mentioning it. This is a great way for people to get to know different people within the organization, having those one-on-one -on -one meetings with everybody. Thanks, Sylvia. Anybody else have something to share? 
have Cheryl saying, have all new hires meet our CEO. It's a great idea. It makes them feel special that they get to meet the CEO. You bet. Um, a gift bag. Selena, that's another lovely idea. A gift bag, a note, you know, maybe you put, you know, a cup in it. Again, it doesn't have to be this huge ordeal, but something that's a little special for them as a way to say, thank you. And I'm glad you're here. And shadowing team members, I think this is another wonderful idea, especially as they're getting up to speed so they can see work in real time. These are fabulous ideas. Please continue to pop those into chat. This is awesome. Thank you. So let's talk about the retention side. So, and I'm noticing my time here, so I want to pop through these. So obviously wanna, we want to make sure that every employee has enrichment in their job, that we are taking care of them. And so how do we keep employees engaged? First and foremost, we wanna make sure that they have very clear responsibilities, that there is no confusion of what Judy is doing and what's Miriam doing. And then Miriam doesn't get confused because Judy's the new hire. So everybody understands who's doing what. And after that first 90 days, have stay interviews. What are those? It's just simple conversations that you're doing a, a check-in with them. Are they happy? Are they engaged? What challenges are they having? How can you help them? You know, and these are can really be the same as one-on-ones, but that you're checking in with them in a purposeful manner. And by listening to your employees, you're 4.6 times more likely to have them feel empowered at work. And that's what we want. We want go-getters, self-initiators, and this is going to help them do that. And show empathy. 96% of employees believe that showing empathy by, from their leaders, by their leaders, increases intention retention rather. So show that empathy and understanding. And that 87% of employees expect employers to support their desire for work-life balance. Now, work-life balance has, has gotten a little bit of a bad rap during this kind of thought about quiet quitting. Um, but by helping them balance their workload, making sure that they're not overwhelmed is the role of a leader. And if they need help reprioritizing, help them do that. And we should not be expecting every employee to be working consistently 50 hours a week or more than that. If you see there's this trend of someone consistently working, that should be your cue to check in with them to see, do they have the right priorities? Are they taking on someone else's responsibilities? So this is a good opportunity for you. You also want to make sure that you're developing your employees. And this is how, this is what employees want. This is how they stay with you. They stay engaged and they stay retained with your organization. So there's something called the 70-20-10 rule around development. So 70% of their job, their work, should really involve challenging assignments. It's their day-to-day -day work. Um, once you see someone master something, give them something more challenging. So that's the 70%. 20% is around developmental relationships. What is it that um, we are giving them that is having them stretch their boundaries and grow? And the last 10% is, hey, you're sending them off to training or you're doing online training. It's something more formal. So 
I think some people misunderstand when, when I say development or when they hear development, they automatically think, oh, well, I don't have the budget to send them for training. But development, the bulk of it is really around the work that they're doing and how do we help them grow within the work that they're doing. It's so important to have a feedback process, both formal and informal. Um, I encourage you, if you do not have a formal performance management process in place, that you get one. Doesn't have to be complex. Employees want to know how they're doing. And I would encourage you to have, you know, these ongoing periodic informal feedback sessions. So when they get to the formal feedback session, no one's surprised. They understand where their challenges are or they understand where they're really doing well. People want feedback. And I've talked to a number of employees who've quit because they've said, well, my manager never tells me anything about how I'm doing. A am I doing great? Am I not? They don't know. There's no engagement. There's no interaction. And you want to be able to talk to them about what's next for them. And I understand, especially within nonprofits and in smaller organizations, it's hard to say, oh, well, in a, in a, in a, a company of two, you know, in one year, you're going to be promoted to the director. Well, that's not very likely, right? We know this. But are there opportunities that we can say, hey, you know what, this year you learned this, you execute it flawlessly, and next year you can take on more. Whatever that may be, it's not so much important as the what, but is to be able to have the conversation with the employees so they understand what's potentially on the horizon. And people can look towards that. One thing um, that I've also heard from employees during exit interviews is this notion about lack of transparency, that when they don't know what's happening, they get confused. And we don't want them to leave, especially within that first year. Well, we don't ever want them to leave, right? But we don't want them to leave early on in that first year. So again, being really clear about what path they may have within your organization. Remember that old saying, my father used to say this, and I'm not going to necessarily repeat it, but you know what it means about assume, right? So we don't want to assume that they know what's in our brain, that we don't want to assume that they know everything we want them to know. So over-communicate, over-communicate, especially within that first 90 days to even six months period over-communicate expectations. We want you to be a part of that 12% that has a strong onboarding program. Having clear, consistent, timely feedback will help you get there. And offering a variety of activities for that person even those things that are outside of kind of the normal scope of their job will keep them engaged, keep them interested in their role. And listen to your employees. What do they want? And quite frankly, it might be that because of your small organization, the needs change. I mean, every day we're dealing with something new and view that as an opportunity to give that person something new to work on. And all of these activities will absolutely help you engage with your team, which will help retain them. So any thoughts, questions, comments, pop them in chat or come off mute.
Judy. This is Paige Stevenson. Um, one of the things that we did as a senior leadership uh, group is we actually read the book Power of Moments together and thought about our, um, our onboarding uh, with that as sort of the framework. Uh, and that was extremely helpful for us to think about that and to think about the uh, that especially the onboarding, uh, almost like someone would think about something from a hospitality perspective. Uh, and when we began to put our put those kinds of glasses on, it helped us um, identify areas where we could really improve. Oh, Paige, what a wonderful idea. I so appreciate you sharing that. I've not read Power of Moments, but you were literally the second person just in maybe the past month that's mentioned that book. Oh, I will say I'm a huge um, Chip and Dan Heath fan. So, you know, anything that's got uh, them on it, I highly recommend. Awesome. Thank you, Paige. Um, please take a snapshot of um, my LinkedIn connection. Please reach out, connect with me. If you ever have thoughts, questions, uh, please reach out. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Um, and if you have ideas that I can share with others, I would love to hear those too. The ones that you guys popped into chat today were phenomenal. And finally, here's, here's the PDCs, but um, Desmond A is going to send out the PowerPoint. So the PDCs will be in here. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask. But I think, Miriam, that now gives you a chance to um, wrap up. Well, thank you so very much, Judy. We appreciate your time and your expertise. I know that I wrote down a couple of different things um, that's going to help me in my organization. Um, I recently hired some staff members, so it was great to say that I've checked off some things on the list, but then there are some things I thought, because I have remote staff, like, oh, you know what, I can incorporate this into the onboarding process and orientation and all that good stuff. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I think it was just very timely, timely and relevant. Um, we also want to thank every one of you, each and every one of you for joining us today. Um, I would be remiss if I did not say that I forgot our leadership chair when I was introducing the whole that, you know, a group for the operations peer network, Stig Rasmussen. He is the leadership chair um, for our uh, operations peer network. And we also want to thank all of our network members for the work that they've done this year in providing programming for our peer network. This is our last session for this year. When I say year, the calendar year, or not the calendar year, but the fiscal year for Together SC. And so we'll begin um, new sessions probably toward the end of the summer in August and September. September. So look for look for additional information about you know upcoming events um, toward the end of the summer. So we want to thank you all for joining us today. Ben um, Bullock, the Chief Operating Officer of Together SC, was not able to make it, so we don't have any additional announcements. So we're going to let you go. Oh, ben, I'm, here. I'm here. I'm hey. here. Um, but oh, I don't hey. have any additional announcements. <laughs> okay. Awesome. 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 I wanted to make sure you had time to do that, but I didn't see you pop in. So thank you for letting us know you were here today. Um, uh, so if there are no other announcements or anything else that we need to cover today, we can, we're going to let you guys get back to your busy day. Ben, do you want to say anything before we jump off? Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Judy, for, for this wonderful um, workshop and, um, and uh, look forward to everyone to uh, upcoming uh, developments in the operations peer network as we uh, move on into the next year. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Y'all have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.